Ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Mario Armstrong. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. So good to see all of you here. You guys having a good day or what? Yeah, good day. Good day so far. That's good. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Hey, uh, Apex, what about you? Are you having a good day? Any day I can be of service is a good day, Mario. Well, you've been a great service. You've been doing a great job. Um, let's see what kind of day our fellow attendees have been having. I'm going to check some social media stats right here. They just... They just came in, so hold on. Let me see what we got going on. Okay, here we are. We have, all right, so here's the latest update for social media. More than 5,500 mentions on Twitter have generated, get this, a reach of 61 million impressions. That is a massive amount of impressions. And uh, we were trending in Boston and the U.S. after this morning's kickoff as well. Uh, speaking of social media, we have an incredible guest that you all are here to meet, learn from, and to celebrate. And we're giving you a great opportunity. You can send me a question if you have a question that you would like to ask us, uh, that you would like to ask basically of uh, William Gerstenmeier. Send it to me and put a hashtag LiveWorks on it. So if you have any questions about space exploration, about the NASA missions, about what's happening, what's not happening, what the future looks like, anything that you would like William to answer, go ahead and tweet that right now. Use Twitter, tweet that out, hashtag it with LiveWorks at the end. We'll find it and we'll hopefully get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. All right, so get those questions coming in. Uh, Apex, do we have some other housekeeping notes? Happy hour in Extropolis begins at 6.15 p.m. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good update. That's a good one. Uh, do you take a little drink now and then, uh, Apex? I am thirsty for knowledge. Industry <laughs> meetup receptions begin at 7 p.m. in the seaport area. Thirsty for knowledge. Note to self. I'll take that. All right. Thanks, Apex. Appreciate that. And don't forget, tomorrow at 8 a.m., we will be here for our very first live talks session. So that's going to happen right here with Sudip Singh, Global Head of Infosys Engineering Services. We'll also hear from uh, Aiden Quilligan, who's the global lead for Accenture's Industry X.0. But right now, let's take a little bit of a step back and get some perspective. Apex, can you switch us to an overhead view? Switching to overhead view. Okay, that's cool. Uh, Apex, can you zoom out a bit? Zooming out. Okay, that's us in the exhibition center. Okay, I see the lawn on D. All right, uh, zoom out a little further, Apex. Zooming out further. Uh, I'm, can, a little further? Seriously? <laughs> Yeah, please. Hey, oh, that's perfect. That's exact. That sets the stage perfectly. Thank you so much for that. Now, William Gerstenmaier has led a long and illustrious career at NASA. Many of you have heard this name. And he has had served as operations manager for the shuttle and for the Mir programs. He directed the safe completion of 21 space shuttle missions to assemble the International Space Station. Currently, Mr. Gerstenmaier is an Associate Administrator for NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Directorate. In this capacity, he provides not only strategic direction for all aspects of NASA's human exploration of space, uh, but he does so much more, and he has such a long track record of history there. And he said to me backstage, I want to talk about the future. I was like, this guy is incredible. Where does he get his energy from? We're so honored to have him with us today, and here to help recognize his lifetime of achievement is going to help us right now is Bobby Grimes. Now, Bobby is representing the Board of Governors of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So let's give a warm welcome for Bobby Grimes. Thank you, Mario. On behalf of LiveWorks and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, it is my distinct privilege and honor to present the Lifetime Achievement Award for Innovation Excellence in Engineering to today's honored guest. This important award pays tribute to an eminent engineer who has made a career of advancing the engineering profession and whose achievements have profoundly impacted humanity. 
At ASME, it is an important part of our mission is to celebrate engineering excellence. Founded in 1880, ASME is a not-for-profit professional society that enables collaboration, knowledge sharing, and skill development across all engineering disciplines while promoting the vital role of the engineer in society. At our core, we aim to be the essential resource for mechanical engineers and other technical professionals throughout the world for solutions that benefit humankind. The award I'm, about to, I'm gonna present today is a Lifetime Achievement Award for in Innovation Excellence in Engineering. It's a mouthful. Among other considerations, recipients of this award must meet the following criteria. They must be an engineer in any discipline by education and training. They must have demonstrated an exemplary commitment to professional excellence across a career spanning at least 25 years. They must have demonstrated that their work has advanced the profession, exhibited technical competence, and significantly contributed to public service, research, or practice in the engineering profession. They must have demonstrated innovation and creativity in the application of engineering practices and techniques to solve significant challenging problems. And they must have shown a willingness to share their personal experiences with others who have influenced others to either seek engineering as a career path or inspire others to take their engineering careers in new directions. This year's award recipient not only meets all those criteria, he nails them. William H. Bill Gerstenmeyer is the Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations at NASA. As you will soon learn, Bill has been the right man for the job time after time after time. In this position, Bill Gerstenmeyer provides strategic direction for all aspects of NASA's human exploration of space and cross-agency space support functions of space communications and space launch vehicles. He provides programmatic direction for the operation and utilization of the International Space Station, development of the Space Launch System and Orion spacecraft, and is providing strategic guidance and direction for the commercial crew and cargo programs that provide logistics and crew transportation to the space station. Bill began his career in NASA in 1977 at the then Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, performing aeronautical research. He was involved with the wind tunnel tests that were used to develop the calibration curves for the air data probes used during re-entry on the space shuttle. Bill received a Bachelor of Science in, in Aeronautical Engineering from Purdue University in 1977 and a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Toledo in 1981. He completed coursework at Purdue in 1992 and 93 for a doctorate in Dynamics and Control with emphasis on propulsion. For his technical contributions and leadership in national and international human spaceflight programs, Mr. William H. Gerstenmaier was elected into the 2018 class of the National Academy of Engineering. Bill is married to the former Marsha Ann Johnson. They have two children. Encyclopedia and it had a picture of human spaceflight, it would be Bill Gerstenmaier's space. His legacy will always be the collaboration with our international partners and the stitching together that we needed to build the International Space Station. Bill Gerstenmaier shaped uh, not just the U.S. and NASA's human spaceflight program, but spa human spaceflight uh, for the entire world. Engineers are the ultimate problem solvers, and to me, Bill's the ultimate. He can work on so many levels. He solves things at the big picture level, as well as down at the detailed level. He can engage with the best of them. Shuttle program, station program, and now all of human spaceflight for NASA. He's done a fantastic job. 
Congratulations on the Lifetime Achievement Award. I, you've taught me so much over the 12 years that we've known each other. I can't think of anyone who deserves this award more. Well, how fantastic to see Bill Gerstenmeyer receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award for Innovation Excellence. There's nobody I can think of more deserving than this Lifetime Achievement Award than Bill Gerstenmeyer. This is for me, Jeanette, your sidekick. Congratulations, well deserved, and I'm glad to be here for this long journey with you. Thank you. You've been the right man for the job, time after time after time. As a country, we should be very thankful he's at the head of our human space flight exploration program. Congratulations, Bill. No one's more deserving of this than you. And thank you, really, for being an amazing human being who is carrying us much, much further into the solar system over the next few years. Congratulations. Whoa. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you the person who has proven to be the right man for the job time after time after time, recipient of the ASME Lifetime Achievement Award for Innovation, Excellence in Engineering, Mr. William H. Gerstenmeier. Congratulations. All right, I'm here. You hold this. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Another round of applause. Another round of applause. Go ahead. Give him another round of applause. Right. This is history right here. This is history. Thank you for those of you that are standing right now. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. For those of you that are standing, take this all in, Bill. This is you, man. This is your hard work and acting right here. It's your moment. All right. I'm just one member of a large team, so. Understood. We got an awesome team, and I'm, I'm looking for new recruits for the team. So all, right. so all you here, uh, if you want to be part of the space business, we're ready for you. We need you. That's fantastic. A humbled human on top of all that. Well, your team, I'm sure, appreciates you saying that. Bobby, thank you so much for you, kicking us yes, off sir. and getting this right. done. Really appreciate it. It's a great looking award there, Bill. Yeah, man, that's it. nice. Really did a great job here. Well, I get the pleasure of sitting down with you for a few minutes that we have here together and you know, asking some questions that we think would be really great for the audience to hear from, and we okay. appreciate you sharing. And then we're also going to take some social media questions. So if you haven't done so already, people, make sure you send in any of your social media questions. We'll get to those. Just hashtag it, uh, hashtag LiveWorks, and we'll try to get those questions in. I'm going to start with something just to give us a little conversation and make it easy for you. Okay. Uh, I, I know we're talking about moving forward, especially in a conference like this. Um, I want to talk a second about how you got to where you are. And the question that comes to mind is, at what point did you know you wanted to be an engineer? I'm curious about this. Yeah, I guess uh, if I go all the way back when I was a pretty small kid, um, I like to just take things apart and, and see how they worked. So, yeah. so I can remember dismantling uh, many things at home, <laughs> and uh, somehow my parents were uh, tolerant of all that, and they kind of encouraged it. So I think there were some early engineering tendencies to try to understand how things work, and, and, and just a curiosity that, that just kind of you know, continued through my entire career. Yeah. What was your return rate of success of repairing those things back? What would you say? It, it wasn't so high. It was, <laughs> I would say, I, I remember I had a little electric motor and I knew if I put one D bolt battery on there, it would spin at one speed. So then I put two and then it, oh, it even went faster. Yeah. And I go, wow, what if I plug it into the electric socket in the house? <laughs> So I remember plugging it into the electric socket and all the lights going out in the house and yeah. my parents going, what's going on? You know, and, and, but it was, it was that curiosity. But the neat thing was my parents encouraged me and let me experiment. And if it didn't work out right, it was still cool. And, and I think that really helped me throughout my career. Yeah, that's, that's an important point. You know, um, 
uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about this often too. He talks about like not shutting down our kids' curiosity because of what we know may, may happen. Right. Like they'll find out that if they hold the juice that way, it will spill and it will yeah. fall and it will make a mess. But that's, they don't see that. They need to learn that. But yeah. we try to maybe inhibit them or say, no, don't do that because you'll spill it. We don't give them a chance to actually spill. Yeah. So it sounds like you, you know, your parents were that, let them play, let them figure it out. This is good for him. Let's, yeah. just, let's support yeah. his curiosity. And I think that's important for all of us is, you know, as we, we do these huge challenges, they're not easy, right? And, and they're not going to be all successful. But right. I don't think you look at them as failures. You look at it as this is a chance to learn, right? So, yeah. so what did I learn out of this thing? And how can I use that in the next time? So I don't make those same mistakes. But I think if you think of them as failures, that's the wrong way. You just need to think of them as, ooh, I can learn of something or explore or try something right. different. Yeah, and I love that, you know, the technology community is created, I've said this often, fail fast. Yep. It's, you know, we, if we really embrace that philosophy, and if management said, it's okay for you to try, you're not going to lose your job for trying things, right. you would have more people taking more risk, and that would create more opportunity. Yep. And earlier, it's funny you bring up the word curiosity, because I mentioned that earlier after Jim Hemmelman was talking, and it got me thinking about when he was talking about uh, P to C, and 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 pace to pace and how to make change and how to move towards change and i was like curiosity is what ultimately creates more opportunity yeah. so when you were thinking about and being a part of things like an audacious dream people in here have a lot of visions they're doing a lot of things that they want to see happen for the world lots of big plans how do you shape or how can you help them understand your strategies for shaping such a big vision and figuring out how to actually move the meter. Yeah, again, I think you, you kind of break it into little pieces and you start out moving forward, but I think you have to have a, a real optimism, right? That you have to believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing, that, hey, this can actually work, and then you go do that, and then you experiment, then you learn, and, and you use that curiosity to learn what works and doesn't work, and, and that can help you even be safe or make sure things work right. But then you also have to have just a, a huge courage because there's going to be all these people that are discouraging you all along the way that right. this isn't going to work, this <laughs> isn't going to happen. Nobody ever did that before. You know, if you think back to the space program, you know, when we, we talked about going to the moon and, and the president challenges to go to the moon, you can look up at the moon and you go, we're going to put people on that right, thing? Right, I right, mean, right. this is not possible. Right. But again, the engineers took that huge complex problem, broke it down into little pieces, and with this optimism, with this curiosity and this courage, it's amazing what we can do as a population and a people. And that's, that's what I get excited about. I mean, yeah. we're on the front, e front edge of trying to move human presence in the solar system. And we're going to pioneer space. We're gonna, right. We've had people living on board the space station for 18 years. They've been off the planet. And so when will we start moving people to where they actually live in space? We yeah. start pioneering space. That's the, the, the infrastructure. That's the pieces we're trying to put together today to right. allow that future for us all. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's what's so exciting about human exploration and, and going to space. Talk a little bit about, let's, we're going to talk about that for sure, but to kind of get to that point, let's talk a little bit about the International Space Station. Uh, in fact, we're looking some, for some, at some images right now, right? Yeah. These are 4K? These are 4K explain, video. Yeah, explain what we're seeing here. Yeah, these are 4K video taken from Space Station uh, by crews, and, and you get a chance to see the planet in a totally different way. And, and I think that's an important thing about space is it, it changes your perspective. Like, like you did with Apex at the beginning where you kind of zoomed out from the, from the venue here. Yeah. You start, you get to see the world a different way. And then how can you use that to do new things and exciting new things? So, so without gravity, all of a sudden, the biological systems don't work exactly the same way. So we turn loose pharmaceutical companies. We turn loose um, uh, manufacturing companies to exploit the properties of space where there's no gravity. And it gives them a chance to look at a physical property in a totally different way. Yeah. And then that can spur an innovation that will just blow you away with new products that are coming out. So we, we see all kinds of things. Bacteria tend to get stronger in space for some reason. We're not sure exactly why. But then if you turn that loose to a community, how can you exploit that to, right. to bring new medicines, new drugs to, right. to us here on the Earth? So, so we talk about it on Space Station. We're off the Earth but we're here for the Earth. So yeah. that's what our crews do. So our, our crews, that's their motto. It was on one of their, their pins and patches. It was off the Earth, for the Earth. And, and that's exactly what we're doing in space. These mm. things that we do in space benefit us all here on the Earth. So let's think about that for a second, because from what I understand, there's also like 
super fast internet on the space station now? Man, super fast is a little, a little strong for but, this audience. <laughs> for this audience. But, they're watch, but I understand they're yeah. like downloading and watching movies. Is yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we can't actually stream video up, but we can, we can upload video um, a little bit slower to them, and then they can you know, store it on board, and then they can watch movies. So, yeah. so I think they typically have a Saturday night uh, movie night where they get a chance to watch the latest uh, movies. Sometimes they'll actually get them before we get them here on the ground, and they'll get a chance to watch watch things like Solo and, and oh, other wow. new movies that are, oh, that are just cool. coming out. So yeah. it's pretty pretty special world, but but they can they have an internet phone, they have voice over IP, so they can call anybody they want on the earth, they can talk to anybody and and it's you know it's a pretty amazing environment to be in. But I think that the cool thing is the vantage point, like the pictures we're seeing right. here on yeah. the screen. No, it's beautiful. Uh, and we'll talk about how there's an app that they can actually access. Uh, to see these things themselves. Yep. Um, I'll give it out really quick just to just if people want to write it down. It's called spotthestation.nasa.gov. Yep. Spotthestation.nasa.gov. Yeah, and we, what, we might what, as well just talk about it now. Yeah, and what that allows you to do is you can get a text page then on your phone and you can watch the space station fly overhead in the, in the evenings, so either in the evening or in the morning. And then what's really neat... Uh, like actually I, see it? Yeah, you can actually see this little white dot go across the sky. Is that right? And, and it's very bright. It's almost as bright as Venus. But the thing that, that I like to do is I, I usually get pictures of the crew. So there's six crew on board Space Station today. So I'll get pictures of the crews, and I drag my neighbors out, and Space Station flies over, and they see this little white dot. So I make them look at these pictures of the people <laughs> that are actually there. So yeah. in that little white dot, about the size of a five-bedroom house, wow. are six human beings uh, yeah. on board station and so it's an amazing activity for us but I hope that what we like to do at NASA is someday get it to where more people can go to space so it's not just our astronauts it's it can be more of the population in general can go and experience this unique properties and this unique vantage point uh, of the earth yeah and, and when we think about that um, let's talk about space exploration and what that means for humans Obviously, everyone's you know concerned about risk and things of that nature. But how do you start? What's the when I I really want to frame this more like from this perspective because we're at a conference full of engineers, full of thinkers, full of big ideas and visionaries, and we're also talking about all types of technology like AR and AI and yeah. IoT. And I'm wondering yeah. how that impacts when you've been around the show floor and been at this convention. How has LiveWorks impacted what you see as? things that could be useful or helpful for space exploration. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're, you're looking at an image here, and that's the end effector of the Canadian robotic arm that's there. So, so when you see an industrial robot here, that's basically an industrial robot in space. It's about a 60-foot arm that we use to maneuver things around. So that's just like you see here in the conference. We have a hollow lens on board Space Station for our crews. So when they do maintenance of an item that they haven't seen for a while, they can put the hollow lens on. They can interact with the ground personnel and <laughs> get the maintenance instructions, how to go figure yeah. out how to go put those together. We also have additive manufacturing on board Space Station. We have a 3D printer. Um, we're now printing plastic parts. We had the ability to recycle plastic, to grind it up, and then print some new plastic parts. We're going to get a new head that will do, uh, do materials or do metals in space so we can print some metal parts. And that's going to be really critical as we break the tie with the home planet and we move out. You can't take every piece that you need with you. So now you have the ability to actually print those pieces for you. Another interesting thing is on the ground, they're starting to now print biological pieces so they can actually print a heart valve. But to do it on the ground, because there's gravity, you have to put a starch compound in that gives the, the biological component enough strength that it doesn't yeah. get scrunched down by gravity. Yeah. But in microgravity, where there's no, no gravity to pull that down, you don't need to put that starch compound in. So now you can actually print a heart valve exactly like the one that sits in your body today. Mm -hmm. So it's going to open up a whole new way of, of doing potentially research in space, looking at new components, looking at new things that we can build in space. So, so many of the things we see here in this conference, yeah. the internet of things, the, mm -hmm. the additive manufacturing, the uh, tying of components together, all that's happening on station today. And, and where are we in the development cycle of public-private partnerships being able to come together. Obviously, you know, you're working with, with uh, Boeing and some others, and then there's uh, billionaires that are also trying to do this, get the space as well. And I'm just curious, are there going to be opportunities and standards, I guess, set that will help 
uh, designers and developers and engineers be able to be a part of this process. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like I said at the very beginning, you, the neat thing about space is it's the ultimate team experience. We need everybody to contribute. So there was a time when only NASA could build rocket engines and build spacecraft, but now it turns out private companies can do that with additive manufacturing, with new test uh, techniques, new design tools like we saw this morning. All those can be now done by smaller companies. So we're trying to figure out how we work with all those companies to build our next generation of spacecraft. So we have the, um, the uh, ST, or CST-100 built by Boeing, the okay. Starliner, and we have the uh, Dragon built by SpaceX. And those will fly an uncrewed uh, vehicle built by these private companies with NASA help and supervision to space stations sometime by the end of this year. And then you brought up a very interesting thing we're trying to do is, just like here in the conference, standards are really important. So we have these interoperability standards. We have a, an international docking standard that tells us basically what the dimensions are of the docking interface where two vehicles come together. It tells you the force they have to be clamped together, okay. but it doesn't tell you any details of how to do the design. Huh. So we put that out to the world so anybody that builds that standard can dock to our spacecraft. So, so there's no one in the world that will be excluded from docking to the spacecraft or operating with us. We have one for the atmosphere pressure of 14.7 PSI. We have one for the power standard, one for the avionics standard. All those we're putting out, there's seven voluntary uh, documents we put out, and we're getting comments from people around the world that are that giving right? us comments. We'll set those in place. Then anybody, any country, any small company, if you build to the standards, your hardware can be in space, and you can be operating, and you can be contributing to this vision of moving human presence in the solar system. So it's open to everyone. Yeah, okay. I, I just want to stop there for a second, because I just think that's pretty impressive for someone to be able to say, I worked for this company and we didn't have any plans for ever really, space wasn't on the product roadmap. And now it is potentially on the product roadmap because of the standards and the framework that you're enabling people to do. I just think that's awesome. I want to give you a round of applause for that myself. I don't know if anyone else thinks that's awesome. I think it's awesome. Because what I see is a big picture. What I, what I see is like, well wait, then what you're actually telling me is we can get kids at the educational level very involved in something that's really tangible that ends up being utilized in a meaningful way and yeah. connects them more so to something that can seem so far out of reach and out of touch and create a future of problem solvers we oh. never had before. Oh, absolutely. I, I really enjoy working with the, with the young kids, even grade school and, and high school kids, because they're not constrained by the thought process. I mean, they got a question and- <laughs> They haven't they, become jaded and, yet. And no, they don't, they, they're not in, afraid to be embarrassed, right? It, to the discussion we had before. So they, they want to know how things work, right? So, so one of the big questions was a, was a caterpillar. What does, a, what does a chrysalis do in space? And what will the butterfly do when it comes out of the cocoon? Will it attempt to fly? Or, it, or will it try to walk? Is it, does it inherently know? Is it nature that it knows to fly? Yeah. Or is it nurture? Right. Does it learn to fly? Right. So they wanted to know. So do you know the answer? You no, know, we flew a bunch of, we flew a bunch of butterflies in space and they came out of the, the cocoon and they took one flap and determined that wasn't going to work and then they started walking. <laughs> so so it, it appears that it's some combination of both nature and nurture was there. But that question came from some grade school kids that wanted to see what happens in space when, when this animal now is in a microgravity environment where, where you don't have to flap to fly or, yeah. or fly to get around. And yeah, so yeah. it's just amazing stuff. Yeah, I remember you were telling me a quick story about uh, a, young, a young boy that wanted to know what happens with a jumping spider, spider yes. from Saudi Arabia? From Saudi Arabia, yeah. yes. And, and this jumping spider typically jumps on its prey, it jumps on fruit flies, but in space, it doesn't work that way because the fruit flies just kind of run around. So then right. it learned to grab them. And then we brought this spider back to the Earth. And the same thing happened on the Earth. At the first, first time we had him in the, in the Natural History Museum in Washington, the spider would try to walk after its prey and the prey <laughs> would fly away. And then it immediately said, oops, I'm back someplace different, and it started jumping. Wow. So it's amazing that, yeah. that these biological life forms can make that transition from microgravity to, to uh, zero gravity to gravity, yeah. and, and they can make that transition back and forth. Yeah. But the key thing is, how do we exploit that, or how do we take that knowledge and use it in a way that's productive to make a new product or make something new for us here on the Earth? So, so I think that's the neat thing about space. It changes your perspective, it gives you a different look on the world, and it lets you do things in new and creative ways. 
How do we adopt, you get to work on something that you know is inherently changing your perspective. Many of us are working and sometimes we're so close, and you're probably even sometimes so close to what you're working on that you can lose that perspective. Is there a strategy or a technique or something that kind of keeps that big vision uh, there for you so that you don't lose that? Yeah, I think it's really good when you, when you maybe get outside of the community that you work with all the time and you go out and you interact now with, a, say, a different community. So for me to be here with, with the kind of the digital technology side, yeah. I see pieces of it, but I don't get to see it all the time. But now I get exposed to a different world. And the other thing is also sometimes we take for granted what we're doing, right? You know, I see some of these robots out here. I see the factory where they're going to actually, they print things, manufacture yep. new components. You may think, well, that's just kind of normal because you've been working on it. But for me, who hasn't seen that, I get excited. And in that excitement that I have, I think motivates you to get more excited too. So, so when I'm having a bad day at work, I try to go find some high school or grade school or, or even a college and go, or go talk to the students because then there's this whole new, oh, you're doing what? Oh, yeah. this is really cool. And, and that's, that's the excitement that we, we feel yeah. going forward. That's smart. So, so get outside of your normal comfort zones, go explore, collaborate with others, yep. maybe look for some hybrids, and when you're having a bad day, go find some young kids that are interested in your industry and get recharged yep. again. Yeah, exactly right. You <laughs> That's got a it. great, it's a great recipe. Yep. Uh, I do have a straightforward question. Why not just leave this to the billionaires to figure out? I think, again, I think what's kind of good is the, the government's role is really risk reduction. So, mm -hmm. so before it makes sense for a company to invest in something, the government can invest in it, and then if it makes sense, then there's a private sector market that gets developed, and then they can take it and move forward. You know, if you look at the internet way back when, it started kind of this, um, you know, in, uh, ARPANET, right, where they were transferring uh, DOD data or Department right. of Defense data back and forth, right. but then it took off in this other world once yeah. there was a way to go do that. Or if you think about the global positioning satellite system, mm -hmm. right? The government provides the satellites, but then all the smarts, all the applications, the things we use in our cell phones, the things we yeah. use in our cars, all the applications for GPS came from this innovative, creative world on the side. So the government's role is to kind of do those hard things that don't make sense, but then turn it over and then let the private sector run with the innovation and run with the excitement that moves forward. So I think it's a, it's a great time. It's a great, great time to be in space. You know, I also get asked sometimes, you know, why do you put humans in, in the environment, right? Why don't you just do it all robotic? Right, right? sure. It, and I think there's a real advantage when that creativity of the human needs to be there. You know, if I look back at Apollo 17, the, the last Apollo mission to the moon, we flew a geologist, uh, Harrison Schmidt, and, and he was able to get the best samples back because he was a geologist. He knew what to look for. Yeah. His eyes were there. Yep. He had in his hand a hammer where he could break off the right pieces of the, of the moon surface to bring back. So I think it's, a, it's an expense to put that human there, but that creativity, that ingenuity of the human in that remote environment is really, really important. And I think you see that even here, as, as you're starting to make tasks simpler for the human, what is the, the right role for the human and yeah. for the artificial intelligence? I saw a couple discussions on that today here at the conference, and, and I think we're exploring that, but the real power is both. It's, yeah. not, it's not just the human or it's not yeah. just the robot, it's how do you bring those together in new and creative ways? Yeah, no, you bring up a really great point. I saw uh, in the morning keynote, we all were here, and we saw when Jim Heppelman put up on the screen, basically like systems, but then also like the human parts. And it was really a great way to kind of juxtapose when you're looking at circuitry and then when you're looking at like the blood flow of my system or you're looking at the, f the frame of a human skeleton and the frame of like a jet wing. Like it was yep. really kind of interesting to kind of see this juxtaposition of what yep. you're talking about, of blending the two. And that's why I, 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 uh, I, I like his, the, the model that he came up with was like prepare to change. Yep. So it's yep. embracing this idea of we can put humans in places, and yes, there may be some sticky conversations that we're going to have to get around, yep. but hasn't that always been the case whenever we yep. move forward in society? Yep. I think that's always the case. I, you know, we're really operating on the frontier, and, and to operate on the frontier, you need the best and the brightest from everyone. You need those creative ideas, and you need new ways to solve problems. And, yeah. and that's what really, I think that brings out the best in all of us. When you're really challenged and there's not an answer, you know, I think some of us are 
are wired to where there's no answer in the back of the book, right? That, that this is the question that, that <laughs> right. nobody really quite knows how to answer. But, but, yeah. but there's some of us that, man, that's the excited. I mean, that's why we're ready to go. And that's yeah. why we're excited. And, and that's, that's, that's the heart of what we're trying to do. And I, I think it brings out the best and, and shows us what, what we as a human species can really accomplish. Now, uh, Neil Armstrong, same last name. Yeah. Yeah. Not family related, sorry. For all those that want to meet me and take pictures, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Neil Armstrong is not my cousin. He's not a distant relative. But uh, what was it? About 49, I wrote down, it was about 49 years uh, since he set foot um, in the moon sea of tranquility. Uh, will it take another half century for a man or woman from Earth to repeat that giant leap to the surface of Mars, or you think sooner? No, I think it'll come faster. I think, again, you know, we're taking those kind of simple steps right now. You know, this year I described that we'll have two private companies, again, return launch capability back here to the U.S., uh, SpaceX and Boeing will yep. do that, and that'll be exciting. But then I think that opens up the, the, uh, the sphere for more people to fly to space, because the idea was NASA doesn't own these designs for the first time. These are owned by the companies, so they can market their spacecraft to anyone that wants to go fly in space. We'll use the space station in creative ways where people can go use the space station for research and other activities, um, and they can, researchers can go there and operate. So I think we're moving in that direction. I think we'll get back to the surface of the moon first as kind of a, a learning place, a proving right. ground to get, get smart, and then we're going to head towards Mars. So yeah. I think it'll be less than, than the time that, that we were away from the, from the moon. But, but I'm the optimist, right? I, yep. have, I have that curiosity. I want to push. It's up to the folks in this room and that next younger generation to make those dreams a reality. But I think we've got the technology, we've got the smarts, I think we've got the drive and the will. It's time to put it all together and, and again, see what we can do, move, move human presence in the solar system. If, if one's watching right now, whether online or in this audience, and, they're, and they are an optimist, they see the glass half full, uh, but maybe, just maybe they don't have the right environment that completely supports that, or even understands how to support that. And so they feel maybe a little, you know, a little worn down because they can't seem to get any forward progress. Is there some small step that you've seen work when you're trying to get, uh, you know, uh, government organizations or international collaborations like you've had to do with the space station? You have a lot of experience getting so many varying people to come together that normally don't communicate together. And I'm just wondering, is there some small sample or takeaway that the people that are working here that maybe feel really charged about going to do something but then get defeated when they try to present it at work? Yeah, I think, again, you have to have kind of that deep motivation that what you're doing is right. But then I think you got to also sometimes not focus on the problem at hand. Sometimes you just study and stare and you're just working that problem. Sometimes it's better to just kick back, step back, take a moment and relax. You know, sometimes when you're working hard on a problem, you go to sleep and the next morning, whoa, the answer's right. there, right? right? You need that way to pull back and look for a different way or a counterintuitive thinking. Challenge yourself to think in a different way. So you've been attacking this problem one way, you've been trying to get these people to work together and they just don't want to work together, try something different. You know, try, yeah. try a totally different approach and, and you'll be surprised yeah. sometimes or focus in a different direction. Right. So, so I think that's a piece of the creativity that, you know, that, that spark comes from when unique things are put together right. in a different way. And, and how, right. do you, how do you generate that amongst people? And, yeah. and, and I'm continually uh, impressed with my team. If I can explain to them the problem at hand and then I don't tell them how, and, and I just kind of step back. Mm -hmm. I'm continually blown away by the solutions that I get from this, this amazing team that I work with. I, I remember we, we had a hailstorm while the shuttle was sitting out on a launch pad and there was 6,000 dings on the outside of the tank where the foam was damaged by hail. Okay. And I looked at this tank and I said, there's no way we're ever gonna fly this tank. We're just gonna have to scrap this thing and start over again. But my team came to me and they said, I think we can fix it. Huh. And I said, Okay. <laughs> and I said, I didn't know how. And they figured out an innovative, creative way to fix the entire external surface of that tank. With a, they built new machines, they ground stuff off. Three different companies had to figure out a way to pass data back and forth between each other. They, they reinvented an entire paper process system yeah. where one company would have their technicians work on it, they provide it to another company that would certify the testing was done right and it was put on place. I had no idea this would all come about, and lo and behold, we flew that tank, and nothing came off of that, that tank. Right. It was a perfect tank. And, yeah. And, but 
to me, don't underestimate the power of the team. Don't underestimate the power of the folks around you to solve these complex problems. Describe the problem you're trying to solve, step back and give them the resources, give them the cover, you know, make sure if they have a stumble and they fail, you cover for them. It's fine. It's, yeah. it's okay. It's my fault if it doesn't work right, but have at it. And, and it's amazing what this team's going to accomplish. It's impressive that you would say that in the position you're in. And the other thing that's really ironic or connected to this is that earlier today, Dr. Linda Hill was here from Harvard, and she was talking about leadership and innovation. And one of her things is, you know, stepping, she looked at so many, they did massive academia research and other stuff about so many of these companies that have had explosive, explosive growth. And it was mostly because they set the stage and then they stepped away. Yep. They entrusted their people to make things happen. And they didn't have just, uh, what does she call it? She calls it, uh, create, I think she calls it creative abrasion. Yes. Not brainstorming. Yes. yes. And yeah. it's where you really are having some friction to oh, try yes. to uncover new I ideas. Yep. Yep. And, and that's okay, but your job, right, as an innovation leader, according to her, which I agree with, is you create an environment where that's not toxic, right? Mm. The fact that there's a little bit of abrasion between you and somebody else, it's not personal. No. We're just trying to solve this problem, and I got a slightly different idea. And then yes. if you create an environment, where that innovation can thrive and grow, there's no end to what can occur. So, so that's, the, that's the cool thing about what we do. And, and my business is what's really special. My business absolutely requires us every day to be in that innovation realm, to look for new ways of doing business and not do it exactly the same way. And, and that's what gets me excited every day because the problems are new every day. Some of them are mundane, some of them are routine. <laughs> They're frustrating, but but with this team and, with, and our goal, we understand the mission. I think that's another thing she talked about is there's a common vision that, that unites all the, the group to work for that common vision. And that's another thing that we're very blessed in, in the human space flight business is we have that vision. You've had many moments, uh, obviously, in your career, and you still, you're not done. Right. We're not that's, retiring that's, you here. That's good. That's good. <laughs> you just got an award. I know it's a all lifetime right. achievement award, but you still have a second life to still keep going yep. with this. Um, is there a story or two, uh, we heard one about what you didn't think could, could happen, and it did. I'd love to hear another story about maybe something where you thought, oh, we're doomed here, or, or this idea is not gonna happen, and somebody or someone or something took place that really shocked you. Yeah, and <laughs> we were, we were uh, the space station was up and operating, and we had, uh, it's all computer controlled, and then one day, just prior to a, a launch from Russia, all five computers shut down on board the space station. They all stopped. And it turned out that there was a problem with the hard drive and the computers. And they all had the same symptom that was underlying the, the, the problem. And w at one time, they all decided they were all five hard drives crashed at the same time. And we lost the entire control of the space station. Jeez. And I thought, this is it. We're done. We can't point at the sun. We can't communicate with the Earth. But lo and behold, we had this little piece of software, we called it the Mighty Mouse software. And it was, My Mighty, Mighty Mouse, Mouse was its <laughs> name. And, and it was a little piece of software, which was just this dumb software that would point station in one attitude without any attitude reformation or information. It would get it there and it would allow us to communicate with the earth. That thing kicked in, put station in the right attitude, allowed us to communicate with station. We were able to reboot all the computers and recover the entire space station prior to this Russian vehicle with Dennis Tito arriving and docking at space station. Yeah. So, so the thing to me was, I'm like, we're done, it's all over. But then again, some brilliant engineer somewhere had this little tiny piece of code and when we put all the big fancy computers on, they never removed that piece of code and it was a backup piece of code that was kind of the doomsday code that when it all happens, <laughs> right. it's gonna, it's gonna yeah. keep you safe and it's gonna get stationed to where at least we can communicate with station. Yeah. So like, uh, it was amazing. And I, and I remember when we first had the command, we, we couldn't communicate to the crew, so we had a mm. camera and we pointed it at a light bulb and we, on board space station, we sent a command to turn a light bulb on and a light bulb came on. I'll never forget the cheer that went up amongst all the engineers that we can command the station, we're gonna pull this thing out, we've got it fixed. That's a, a pretty good story for sure. How long did it take? What was the time frame between? I would say it was probably maybe a full day, 20, okay. 24 hours. It's a lot of sweat. It That's was a, a lot of sweat. a lot sweat. of worry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but, but again, you know, they don't all turn out well. But, but again, I think the key thing is you just keep trying. You just keep that innovation moving forward. Yeah.
Is there a moment in, in time when you think, you know, I think about movies like um, Hidden Figures, and there's been so many other great movies. I know, I think it's what, First Man is yep, yep, coming out? Coming up, yep. um, and I know that it's been a lot of NASA involvement from um, everything from research to being a part of really making sure the authenticity is there and all these things. And when I think about uh, the women of Hidden Figures and other women that also have just done so much, um, I'm, I wonder how does that shape uh, the idea of diverse voices, diverse perspectives, global voices, ethnicities, genders, how, how I, I feel like we're preaching to the choir, but I feel like it still needs to be said. I'd love to just hear your perspective on the value that you see from that. You know, I, I think it's absolutely important we have this really diverse workforce, the way you described, right? And diversity in thought and gender and race, all those things, but, but it's also even in thought. You know, when I describe to you, how do you solve a problem, right? Well, if you keep trying to solve the problem the same old way, it's not gonna get yeah, solved. Right. What you need is you need that diversity to come in, someone with a different way. And you need to create an environment where that diversity is, is not only welcomed, but is embraced. Mm -hmm. So that diversity is something that has to be there to be successful or we're not successful. So it's not, I'm gonna do diversity because I need to do diversity. No, it's, do you wanna be successful? You're gonna have to be diverse and you're gonna have to look for ideas. You, you see where you know new ideas come about from the intersection of various disciplines, right? Uh, what I'm seeing here at this conference is where manufacturing is now starting to intersect mm -hmm. with uh, the computer world, with the digital world, right? Or we saw in this morning's talk where the, the human and the, the yep. digital are starting to interact. Yep. That's diversity, where those diverse domains or diverse yep. people come Good together. Point. That's when that spark comes, and that's when that new right. brilliant breakthrough comes, because it, it came out of two disciplines, neither of which could recognize that in their own world it would be there. You know, I often joke that if you know, in the, in the, in the uh, oven world, right? They were trying to cook food faster for people. So the oven engineers, they were just like, man, if we can get this oven up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, man, we can, we can, we can really cook right. that food nuke fast, that food, right? Man, right. we'll nuke that food really right. fast. Right. But then some radar engineer accidentally put his chocolate bar in front of the radar and it melted his chocolate bar. So the microwave oven came, which totally disrupted the oven industry, right? But that came from that, that intersection of diverse yeah. cultures of diverse thinking and disciplines or in people where they come from different backgrounds yep. and you've got to you've yep. got to really listen to those that diversity that's what makes you yeah. successful it's so true uh, there's a big thinker um, it's a good buddy uh, Franz Johansson and he talks about the Medici effect which is this idea of you know bringing different cultures different types of people together that maybe you normally so that's what I said it sounds like a good challenge from you is bring people into the room that maybe you normally don't bring into the room yep. and have them be a part of problem solving yep. is, there, is there a point where you've seen that really be something significantly different yeah, for you? I, th I think again you see it all the time in our business right uh, you know you see the you know, when we have a problem, like if you see the Apollo 13 movie, right? And they had to take the round duct and make yeah. it fit with the square duct, right? right so they right. took a piece of uh, essentially the flight data file or the instructions for the, for the Apollo spacecraft and folded it into a, a transition duct to, to make it work. And right. so these systems were not supposed to work together, but again, that creativity brought those together. So you yeah. need to create, you need to figure out a way that you can bring together and empower teams to work together in these creative ways. And, and that's the, I think that's what uh, she talked about today from Harvard, where she talked about creating that environment. So how so, do you make that part of your business or part of your environment? Yeah. All right, we're going to take some social media questions. While I look to see uh, what we have from social, I want to ask uh, this quick question. I'm curious to know what, what's already all up there. I, my feeling is that there's a bunch of space junk that's kind of just floating around. Like, do we have to clean? Like, what's the air traffic control of all the stuff that's up there already? Well, there's a there's a payload that's going to be deployed from space station. It's a very large CubeSat, but its its purpose is it's debris removal, and it okay. and it's gonna it has several devices. It has like a net to catch small debris. It has a, essentially a, a spear gun that can go out and actually spear a piece of debris and pull it pull back it in. in. Yeah. It, it's got a whole bunch of different sensors to go look at stuff so we're looking now at trying to build some devices to actually remove some debris so if you look at space station on the outside um, you'll see lots of little pot marks where even even pieces of micrometeoroids from way out huh. in the solar system come 
through the Earth's atmosphere and they hit the space station. And that's one of our biggest risks to our crews is we have shielding on the outside that prevents certain sized particles um, from damaging the station, but larger particles greater than about uh, five centimeters or so will actually per uh, penetrate all the way through the pressure vessel wow. and we'll have an emergency evacuation of station. So yeah. this is really serious for us to yeah. remove debris and get things and in, 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 uh, clean up space a little right. bit. So we're putting together some, some new requirements to do that in a better way, but we're also going to look at try to look at some uh, uh, active debris removal systems. Nice. Good to know. Good to know. All right, we got this question right here from Bruce. Look at that, Bruce Heck. Thank you. Uh, LiveWorks, future of humanity in space. What might William Gerstenmaier perspective on the future of food for space travel. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, this is really interesting because, you know, on Space Station, we, we have freeze-dried food, right? Yep. So, so that works well for maybe up to a year, but, but eating the same freeze-dried stuff all the time is not so yeah. good. So we're now starting to grow plants in space for actual consumption. So we've grown last year the first lettuce for crews to eat. We're now looking at some micronutrients, some... Uh, Vegans get to go to space first. Yes, that's right, that's right. So we got tomato plants, we've got some sprouts with the micronutrients that we're starting to grow. So we're looking to augment your diet with, with some actually some stuff grown on station. So that's one piece. The other big thing we have is shelf life problems. If you're gonna go to Mars, it takes you about six months to get to Mars. You stay on the planet for about two years until the alignment gets right and then about six months to get back. Yeah. So that's like a three year journey. So most even freeze dried food doesn't make it for those kind of lifetimes. So we're looking at what is that next generation of long life food? Same thing with pharmaceuticals. We carry dr prescription drugs for our crew members. They all expire today. So how do we get longer duration drugs for our crew members? So those are challenges we're facing today. Yeah. And what, what can we do for both food and drugs that give us that long duration? So yeah. many, many challenges there, but we're starting to experiment with those kind of things on station today. So it's letting us be that test bed to prove these things out before you commit to your journey to Mars. So, right. yeah. so you know, before you cast off from the shore, you better That's know right. that your boat is checked out and ready to go. Right? That's right. Can't wait to tell my wife, get ready, honey. It's <laughs> happening. We're, do we're doing this, but, but let them clean it up first. Uh, LiveWorks, we've got another question here. Uh, Vipul Gol, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest engineering challenge we face today for making next age space exploration? You know, I think, again, propulsion is a big thing. We want to get there faster than we can today. You know, we, can go, we can't go faster than the speed of light, but we want to go fast. And so we need that next generation of electric propulsion, maybe uh, um, uh, solar electric propulsion, where we use the sun to generate the electricity and then it drives electric propulsion, or nuclear electric propulsion when you're away from the sun where there's no sunlight to do that. So I think propulsion technology is something we need to do. From a human standpoint, I think we need to, to deal with the challenges of deep space, where you're now away from the planet, so now um, your psychological conditioning, your ability to, to break the tie with the home planet is going to be really challenged, and how do you operate in an environment? That's right. Radiation's a concern, so how can we shield our crews from radiation? Um, how can we uh, uh, take care of the things that occur in space to crews, because they're, they're they occur, like their muscles get weaker in space, they lose the ability to have balance. How can we compensate for all those things? Yeah. But what I like is all these challenges we're faced with for station, you know, they have benefit to us back here. As we get older, you know, our muscles tend to not be as strong. We, we tend to lose our ability to have balance, those kind of things. So as we mm -hmm. solve those problems for our crews that are gonna have to mm -hmm. face these challenges, we're providing unique solutions for our, yeah. for our population here on the earth. So, yeah. so it's exciting to see that natural balance between the two. Great, all right, we got one more question coming in. Uh, sorry folks, this will be our last one, but let's take it. Uh, from David, thank you David. Uh, NASA had a culture shift well before many other companies. Broke down silos because cross-depth collaboration was critical. How do they maintain that culture and how is it evolving? It's a great question. Yeah, boy, it's, it's hard. I, you, you know, you, especially as you get successful, you then start to build this culture of well, I got success because I did it right. exactly this way, right? Or I didn't involve this company. So you don't want to change. So you, you start getting that, that, that fear that something's not going to work right, and you get fear of failure, and you're, and you're not experimenting. So I think you got to create an environment where you go back 
and you bring in those other cultures. You know, just because, you know, NASA, when we flew the first cargo flights, you know, we were the only folks, we were ready to shut down the shuttle program because it was, you know, we had been to tell by the government to end the shuttle program, but we had no ability to get cargo to the space station. So we kind of had to go out and work with these new companies, whether we wanted to or not, right? Yes. This is not a good thing, but I call it innovation by desperation. <laughs> we had no choice but to innovate, right? And right. the Apollo 13 is probably another case yep. of innovation by desperation. Our crews are going to die unless we innovate. That's so we right. created that urgency, <laughs> that innovation absolutely had to happen. I'm not sure that's a good strategy. <laughs> right. And probably some Harvard uh, <laughs> professor will tell me that's absolutely not what to do, which I wouldn't disagree with. But, but that's one way that I think you can create that culture. But I think you can also celebrate it when somebody discovers some new way of doing business or something new that you just really highlight that. And again, I can't stress how fun it is for me to be work with this huge international team that yeah. is really pushing the frontier. And, and I am blessed beyond blessings to, to work with this team every day. I get excited. I give them challenges all the time. I push them really hard. Yep. And man, they rise to the occasion and it is just, just awesome. So I am, I'm blessed to do this. Uh, this award really isn't for my lifetime. This is really for all the folks that I've worked with throughout the years, throughout the decades. And we're going to do new and exciting and even cooler things in the years to come. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to it. We appreciate the time that you spent with us here. And I know some people may want to grab some quick selfies. And that's a thing that I do here at the show. All right. So I need you to grab the award okay. really quick before we let you go. Right. And uh, grab, grab a good selfie. All right, here we go. Yep, All right. There we okay. go. Hold that right there. And are you going right. to smile? You didn't smile. I'm okay. Show those teeth. Smile. All right. Hey, <laughs> that's as good as it gets. That's fantastic. All right, thank you. Everybody, can we give a really big, warm, well, a round of applause? William Gersmeyer, he is here all right. for inspiring us all to reach for the stars. Thank you so much. Thank Joe. you, Mario. It was a pleasure. Mario, the nearest star is 4.3 light years away. The nearest star is 4.3 light years away. You don't have to bum us out like that, Apex. I am just saying, I could also say that you are the nearest star. Uh, oh, yeah, you hear the audience. They say, aw, Apex. Hey, Brett, but do they say that about me? Yes. They say, that Mario, his very best, is good enough. Uh, yeah, I don't... Okay, Apex, I think that's a compliment. I don't know. Hey, everyone, this has been an amazing first day. Have a wonderful evening. You're free to roam. You're free to connect. You're free to collaborate. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 8 a.m. Say goodnight, Apex. Goodnight, Apex. Oh, there you go again.